you can start then, I guess. Yeah, so right. uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and attending today's session. Uh, today, we have Dr. Regan Chandramohan from Canterbury, U University of Canterbury. And today, he'll be talking about robust and efficient uh, nonlinear uh, structural analysis using central difference time integration scheme. So yeah, thanks, Regan, for taking time and presenting. It's all yours now. All right. Thanks, Bowen, for, for, for the invite. Uh, glad to be here uh, talking to you guys. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. I was in your shoes no more than a few years ago, and I have bothered Sylvia with my own open seas questions quite a bit in the past, which she will attest to some point uh, in today's presentation. So I completely empathize with I mean, I re recognize that you probably are at different stages of your PhDs, different stages of your learning. Uh, open seas, you never ever become an expert. Well, maybe Sylvia is an expert, but nobody else is probably going to be an expert in open seas. You just keep getting better and better. You all, I still continue discovering stuff that I can do with open seas that I didn't know in the past. But again, so what I'm going to talk about today is essentially, I guess, the product of some of my investigations with open seas. Back when I was a PhD student myself, uh, there were some things that didn't really work too well. And so I kind of bothered Sylvia a bit. I bothered Frank McKenna a bit. And I, you know, sort of tried a few uh, workarounds and I found a few things that worked. Uh, these are some of the things that folks tend to not pay much attention to when uh, conducting analysis. So uh, I just thought I'd share some of these uh, results with you all in case you'll find this useful. Okay, so the topic of my presentation is robust and efficient nonlinear structural analysis using the central different time integration scheme, right? So keywords over here, robust and efficient, and I'll talk about what I mean by those. Okay, so typically uh, when people are conducting research you, uh, using nonlinear uh, structural analysis in any form, a lot of emphasis is typically placed on developing the model, that is formulating the problem you're trying to solve correctly. And that would entail developing a detailed and accurate structural model. And that may include, uh, may entail developing a really complex, oftentimes quite a, uh, quite a complex structural model with a large number of degrees of freedom. Uh, a lot of attention will be paid to, you know, assigning uh, model parameters uh, for that structural model. What is the stiffness I need to use? What is the deformation capacity I need to assign to that structural member? A lot of attention is paid to that. Um, as you can see in this top left corner over here, a lot of attention is paid to uh, ensuring that you at least capture the mean or median structural properties. Like in this case, you can see there is the mean post capping uh, strain softening stiffness. And we all know that no structural model parameter is deterministic. There's always some kind of uncertainty associated with it. So some people will crank it up a notch and try to account for uncertainty by doing a few Monte Carlo simulations. And that is uh, regarding the structural model. People also pay a lot of attention to what ground motions they use for their analysis. Right? So uh, if you really want to uh, be completely rigorous about it, you would select an appropriate number, which is usually more than uh, seven or 11, uh, maybe around 20 or 40 ground motions to use. You will ensure that they're hazard consistent, that is they are uh, consistent with the seismic hazard at your site uh, at which the building is located. So this is all what I call formulating the problem correct, developing the model, choosing the ground motions and so forth. Once you've formulated the problem, you will then go on to have to analyze the structural model using the ground motions. And that is, uh, in my experience, what uh, people tend to pay a little lesser attention to. It's almost assumed that once you develop the model and the model works, uh, you can sort of analyze it and you can uh, trust the results. There are, however, a few other issues that uh, one needs to pay attention to. And if one doesn't pay sufficient attention to these, uh, these uh, phenomena that I've described over here, uh, you can get results that either are slightly accurate or in some cases can be grossly inaccurate. Okay. So the first of these is handling numerical non-convergence. Now, this is something almost everyone will experience. Everyone who's conducting any kind of nonlinear analysis will experience at some point uh, with open seas. Uh, techniques for handling non-convergence uh, are mostly heuristic in nature. There aren't any uh, sure shot deterministic methods to handle uh, numerical non-convergence. Uh, 
Uh, other issues you might encounter include the treatment of, say, for example, ill-conditioned matrices, especially when you're simulating response in uh, that push your structure into the large nonlinear uh, deformation range. At those large nonlinear deformations, your stiffnesses can become uh, pretty small. Your stiffness matrix can become close to ill condition, sometimes even singular. And the response of your structure uh, that you obtain by solving a system of equations repeatedly using these ill condition matrices can uh, accumulate quite a few errors. The precision of computations, again, uh, you need to pay attention to. With, so for example, are you using single precision calculations, double precision calculations that will influence the accuracy of your results, believe it or not. Collapse detection criteria. Again, if you are simulating a uh, response into the large nonlinear regime, um, what criteria do you use to detect the onset of side sway collapse? Uh, do you pay attention to whether your model can be, whether your model results are reliable at such, at such large nonlinear deformations and so forth? And finally, differences between analysis software. And this is probably my favorite of them all. And the reason I say it's my favorite is because this is something that all structural engineers acknowledge. For example, if I were to build the same nonlinear structural model in open seas, if I were to build the same uh, build the same nonlinear model in open seas, in SAP, in ETABS, uh, Abacus, a couple of other analysis software, even if I assign the same hysteretic properties to plastic hinges, uh, even if I assign the same boundary conditions, if everything is exactly the same and the analysis parameters are the same, if I run the analyses on all the different software, chances are I'm not going to get the same results. In fact, I'm almost entirely sure I will never ever get the same results as long as you're modeling something, you know, a little more complex in a simple SDUF system. Sometimes even a simple SDUF system, so you see a few differences. And that is a problem because, well, suddenly, the analysis results you obtain are dependent on which software you use. It's not just dependent on the model parameters you choose and the ground motions you choose, which is, again, uh, one of those sources of uncertainty that uh, we often have to contend with uh, in structural analysis. So all of these things should probably give you a sense of how much attention you want to give to the you know, number of significant digits you report your uh, answers to, how much you should rely on uh, your, uh, your analysis results, and how you are meant to interpret them in general. Now that is all about uh, handling those errors that can arise when you're uh, conducting your nonlinear uh, simulations. Another issue is related to efficiency. That again is something we don't often pay attention to, but just leave our analysis running on, uh, whether it be a laptop or desktop computer or a supercomputer, and well, it just takes how long it takes to run. Uh, that is okay as long as you're running a few simulations, but if, like me, as part of your PhD, if you were running thousands or even pushing on millions of simulations, well, that suddenly is not a trivial problem. You, you need to start paying attention to how efficiently you can run your analyses, how quickly you get your results, um, how well you're able to uh, parallelize your computations to run them simultaneously on different processors of your own PC or on a supercomputer. So those are things that we need to start paying attention to and obviously will become, uh, is going to be something that receives more, uh, more and more attention as we move on to the future and more and more of these uh, parallel computations become mainstream. All right, so that's about the background and motivation for what I wanted to talk about. What I want to talk about in this, in this particular presentation is primarily this topic of numerical non-convergence and this issue of efficiency. Okay, so let's start with numerical non-convergence first. You can see in these plots over here, I mean, you probably recognize these plots over here. I'll, probably, I'll talk about these in a bit more in detail, but here I'm essentially solving this non scalar non-linear equation, f of x equals zero, right? So when I solve f of x equals zero, I want to find the value of x that, results in the function of x becoming zero. So essentially I want to find the value of x that uh, corresponds to this curve function passing through the x-axis, right? Or this point over here. That is essentially what the newton raphson uh, algorithm tries to accomplish. And as you can see, there's a few uh, issues that can occur when you use a Newton uh, root finding algorithm. Uh, and I'll talk about these in a few, uh, a, a few slides down the line, but essentially it's issues like this that lead to numerical non-convergence. Okay, 
Now, when we conduct nonlinear time history analyses, any kind of nonlinear analysis, uh, we often tend to, by default, use Newmark average acceleration, right? Because that's the time integration scheme. We're often told, well, it's unconditionally stable. Uh, you can use time steps uh, as large as you like, as long as you're not affecting uh, accuracy. And that almost tends to be the default option. Uh, this Newmark average acceleration scheme uh, is a time integration scheme that is called an implicit time integration scheme. And it's implicit in that, well, you, so you write your equation of motion at the next time step to compute the displacement at the next time step and your velocity and acceleration the next time step as well. Now, yes, the Newmark average acceleration scheme has a number of benefits. It's unconditionally stable. Uh, it has a bunch of uh, other uh, good characteristics, but it does have a few drawbacks as well. And the, one of the drawbacks, probably the most important one, is that like uh, all other implicit time integration schemes, it is iterative in nature. Because when you solve the governing equation corresponding to the Newmark scheme, you have two unknowns. You have the displacement at the next time step, and you have the force, the spring force in the next time step, which are both unknown. Now, you cannot solve one equation for two unknowns, right? And you don't have a second equation to solve for the two unknowns simultaneously. So you're sort of uh, restricted to solving that equation iteratively. You need to start with a guess of a solution, and then you need to see if it satisfies the equation. And then you know you need to uh, adjust that guess appropriately using Newton's uh, uh, algorithm to try and converge to that solution. Now, since it requires iteration, as with any iterative scheme, convergence is never guaranteed. Right? So you will almost always experience numerical non-convergence. Uh, and the chances of you experiencing numerical non-convergence are a lot higher as you move to more large and complex models, and as you start analyzing ground motion, uh, sorry, analyzing your model under more intense and long duration ground motions. More intense because, well, it's likely to produce large nonlinear deformations. Long duration because when your analysis itself lasts longer, so your the probability of you encountering non-convergence becomes larger. Now. When you do encounter numerical non-convergence, I mean, there are a few open sea scripts going around that have been written a long time ago. And that there's usually this uh, traditional set of uh, tests that we will conduct and these sort of attempts to force convergence when we encounter non-convergence. And these will involve a number of steps, typically trying other solution algorithms, like if, uh, the Newton's method doesn't work, you can try well, modified Newton's and so forth. And then you can try decreasing the time step. And usually if, a bunch of those steps are tried and exhausted. You will say, "All right, I cannot uh, uh, achieve convergence using a number using any of these methods." So I'm going to sort of assume that my structure has reached dynamic instability and it has collapsed. Right. So that is usually the standard protocol in this case. It is not based on any science, so to speak. It is just sort of you know a heuristic pro uh, algorithm that has been developed and used for a long time. Now, this non-convergence, obviously, as you can imagine, is an issue in the sense that. Yes, we do. Uh, the state the, in where we are right now, we are able to sort of address these issues of non-convergence by trying a bunch of different things because analyses typically are one-off. Like if you're uh, designing a building, you would probably analyze it under uh, seven or eight ground motions, sometimes 11 ground motions. And you sort of can pay individual attention to each analysis. You can sort of, you know, look at this, conduct sanity checks and uh, so forth. But again, looking forward in the future, we are computational capabilities are going to go up. We're going to be able to routinely conduct more complex simulations. So model complexity was going to uh, increase. The number of ground motions we will be expected to use to conduct the simulations is likely to go up. And you want to be able to automate these simulations uh, to a large extent. And that again becomes hard when you're using these implicit uh, time integration schemes because you cannot really automate these simulations and uh, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to, I've created this model. I wanted to analyze, I want to analyze it using these 10, maybe hundred ground motions. And I'm going to just come back in an R and it's going to run them simultaneously and it'll be done. No, because some of them would have encountered non-convergence. You just have to look through and see what happened. And can you switch the ground motion out? It becomes a bit of a problem, all right? So it is in our best interest to try and get over this uh, bump of non-convergence if possible. 
So what I did, essentially, when I encountered a lot of non-convergence during my PhD, as you can imagine. So what I did back then, uh, with the advice of uh, Frank McKenna and a few others, was tried using the central difference time integration scheme, which is not an implicit scheme. It is an explicit scheme. Right? I'll talk about the difference uh, a bit more uh, shortly. But since it is an explicit scheme, it does not require iteration, and therefore, it sort of completely eliminates this problem of numerical non-converters. There are a few other uh, issues you need to pay attention to when using it, but it does obviate this problem of numerical non-converters. And secondly, since I was conducting so many uh, uh, analyses in parallel, I had to de develop efficient parallel algorithms to conduct them on supercomputers. And especially when you're conducting uh, computationally intensive types of analyses, like multiple stripe analyses or incremental dynamic analysis on high performance computers, you really need to pay a bit more attention to uh, analysis efficiency. Okay, so let's talk about these time integration schemes first. So here I have sort of just a few points comparing the Newmark average acceleration scheme to the central difference scheme. So the Newmark average acceleration is an implicit scheme, and this is the governing equation. So if you see over here, I have two unknowns. This is my displacement at the next time step, u i plus one. And this is the vector of forces in my elements at the next time step, at, so f i plus one. Everything else over here is known, right? Delta t is known, the mass matrix, damping matrix, and this uh, pseudo uh, load vector that is a function of mass, damping matrices, delta t, displacement, velocity, and acceleration at the current time step, all of which is known, and the ground acceleration at the current time step. All the stuff is known. The only unknowns are this vector and this vector, okay? Now, since we have two unknowns, we need to, well, solve this by iteration. And convergence is not guaranteed at any point when you're solving by iteration, okay? Now, if convergence fails, again, like I mentioned, we'll often try a few things. We'll try maybe, changing the solution algorithm from newton raphson we can go to modified newton raphson newton raphson initial stiffness open seas has a large number of these solution algorithms you can cycle through all of them if you like and you can try other implicit schemes with what we call algorithmic damping now frank mckenna has a great uh, presentation uh, up on the internet somewhere where he talks about these schemes the algorithmic damping essentially newmark average acceleration scheme doesn't uh, provide any algorithmic damping but then other schemes in the Newmark family of schemes provide algorithmic damping. That is, they sort of add artificial damping to your system, which is often helpful because it helps damp out these spurious higher modes, which don't really contribute much to your result, but they can cause your analysis to blow up sometimes. So it helps to damp out some of those spurious uh, higher modes. Then uh, another, another thing you can try if your convergence fails is try reducing delta t. If you start with the delta t of 10 to the power minus three seconds, go to 10 to the power minus four, 10 to the power minus five, see if that helps. And the problem, however, is that all of these attempts are time consuming. So each time you encounter non-convergence, if you just start stepping through these uh, methods, especially when you start reducing delta t, you, your efficiency drops considerably because your time step has become now so small that, well, your analysis takes a really long time to complete. If reducing time step even works. And finally, if all your attempts fail, we typically def define structural collapse, say, oh, all right, my structure has collapsed. It looks like, you know, it's properly unstable at this point. It's reached that stage of dynamic instability. I'm just going to say it's collapsed and move on with my life. All right. And that's what people typically do. And people will do that even if the collapse deformation threshold is not exceeded. So by that, I mean, even if your structure, is, even if your building is just at 1% drift, and you're pretty sure that your building cannot have collapsed at 1% drift, you can say, all right, maybe my stiffness matrix is uh, ill-conditioned so that at the next time step, maybe it's gonna shoot from 1% to about 10 or 15%, and that means it has collapsed, even without having simulated that next time step to, me, to verify that for yourself. And moving on to the central difference scheme, this is the governing equation for the central difference scheme. Here again, you have something that's Similar-ish, on the left-hand side, you have a, a linear combination of your mass and your damping matrices. The only unknown, however, is this vector of displacements at the next time step. Everything on the right-hand side is known because they all correspond to quantities at either the current time step or the previous time step, all right? Or they incorporate constants like the mass and uh, damping matrix and so forth. So the only unknown over here is UI plus one. 
So that's essentially solving AX equals B, right? So this is your A matrix. That's your unknown X vector. And this right-hand side is your B vector, which is, well, the known at the current time step. So no iteration is needed. You just solve AX equals B. That gives you a solution vector X and you have your displacements at the next time step. And you keep doing this time step after time step and you get your displacements at every time step and your analysis is done, right? So no iteration is required because there's just one unknown in the system of equations over here. There are a few other efficiencies that you can achieve in the central difference scheme. And that is observable if you sort of look at this quantity in these round parentheses over here. So here you have a linear combination of your mass matrix and your damping matrix. Now, if, now we know that our mass matrix is constant, right? Our mass matrix doesn't change time step after time step unless you're analyzing a very, very funky system where you know, your masses are dependent on some quantity and they change. Like you're analyzing a rocket where as it's going up and it's sort of expending fuel and the mass of the rocket decreases as it shoots up. Well, those kind of situations, your mass is varying with time, but we're not analyzing rockets, we're analyzing buildings. And yeah, buildings, don't shed mass over the earthquake unless you know some kind of facade falls over, but we don't typically uh, incorporate those kinds of things in our model. So your mass matrix is mostly constant or always constant. I don't know if OpenSeas even allows you to change your, uh, make your mass matrix a function of time. So your mass matrix is constant. Your damping matrix can or cannot be constant. That depends on the damping formulation that you use. If you do happen to use a damping formulation where your damping matrix is constant throughout your analysis, well, in that case, this entire matrix in uh, round bra in, in parentheses, these round parentheses, is constant. So that means when you're solving AX equals B, that A matrix doesn't change time step after time step. It's the same A matrix. So depending on the kind of solution uh, methodology you're using, whether you're using Gauss elimination, whether you're using LU factorization, you can factor that matrix. You can factor it into your lower triangular, upper triangular matrix. That is your LU factorization. And you can save those factors. That is, you don't need to refactorize that matrix again and again at every time step. You just save those factors and you use those factors to solve AX equals B for different values of B at different time steps, right? So that makes the computations that you have to perform at every time step much more simpler than in other time integration schemes. So you do gain some efficiency, right? So you only need to factor once. And this also makes it amenable to paddleization very well. And what do I mean by paddleization? Um, let's say you have a really large mesh uh, that you've uh, discretized the structural model into, and maybe you have a few thousand degrees of freedom. Let's say you have eight processors, a computer with eight cores to solve uh, that model. What you would typically do is divide all of those degrees of freedom into well, eight sets and send each set of degrees of freedom to a different processor. And you sort of uh, essentially just split up that entire thousand by thousand uh, matrix into eight different uh, sections and you send each section of the matrix to a different processor. So each processor will solve a part of it and it'll sort of send it back to your master processor will, which will then put together the results. So essentially that allows you to parallelize some computations, run some computations simultaneously. It allows you to get your analysis results faster. Now, as you can imagine, because uh, you need to factorize this matrix just once in your entire analysis, you can compute those factors and send those factors to different processes. And once those processes receive those factors, they don't have to communicate with each other anymore. Processor one doesn't need to communicate with processor two, sending some factors across. So when once you've removed that communication overhead, uh, when you're conducting uh, parallel uh, simulations, you, your parallel efficiency goes through the roof. Your parallel efficiency becomes really high because processors can do their individual computations really fast. It's when they have to communicate with each other, that's when they become a little slower. So by eliminating that communication, the central difference scheme is really, really amenable to parallelization by domain decomposition. Okay, other uh, issues regarding stability. All right, so the Newmark average acceleration scheme is what we call an unconditionally stable scheme. That is, you do not have to worry about what delta T you're using to, to sort of uh, ensure that your analysis is stable. Your delta T is limited only by accuracy. You need to make sure that you're using a delta T that's small enough to give you accurate results, 
your analysis will always be stable. That is, it, that is, it'll never blow up and produce uh, really large uh, deformations, velocities, and so forth. So typically, when for our structural models, we tend to use relatively large delta t's, the order of 10 to the power minus 3 to 10 to the power minus 2 seconds. Although, when we encounter numerical non-convergence, we will often successfully start reducing that. Okay. The, while that's okay, an issue that might come up is the fact that because the time taken to run one analysis is not predictable before you run the analysis, you encounter some difficulties when you're doing load balancing. Now, what is load balancing? Load balancing comes from the picture where, again, if you stop talking about using multiple cores to solve, to run one analysis, let's uh, assume that you're running one analysis per processor. Let's say my structural model is being analyzed using one ground motion at processor one, same model analyzed using another ground motion, processor two, and so forth, maybe running a hundred uh, uh, ground motion simultaneously on 100 processes. You typically want to use some kind of load balancing in there, wherein once one uh, ground motion finishes, a uh, master processor will then assign uh, a next ground motion to it. That cannot be uh, done automatically. You do need some kind of dynamic load balancing because in real time, you need to figure out when one job finishes and when it can start a new job. You cannot uh, know beforehand how long each job will take. So as to, you know, decide, all right, processor one is going to run ground motions one, three, and five, processor two is going to run ground motions two, seven, and nine, and so forth, because, you know, based on the durations of the ground motion. You cannot do that. You need some kind of dynamic balancing. So that makes uh, things a bit difficult. I'll talk about that a little more when I talk about uh, paddle algorithms. Okay. The central difference scheme, on the other hand, is what we call conditionally stable. And again, going back to your basic dynamics classes, the delta T that you use for your analysis using the central difference scheme must be less than T min over pi to ensure that your analysis is stable. What is T min? T min is the period corresponding to the highest mode, or rather the lowest modal period in your entire model. So if you have a 3DOF model, you'll have three modes. Each of those modes will have a certain period associated with it. The highest mode, will have the lowest modal period, right? So if you have a thousand degrees of freedom, you'd have a thousand modes. So T min corresponds to the period of the thousandth mode, all right? You need to ensure that the highest mode, which has the lowest modal period, divided by pi, that delta should be less than that value to ensure that your analysis is going to be stable and it doesn't blow up. And usually for the kind of structural models that we use, delta T usually tends to be pretty small. Uh, you can you cannot run the central difference scheme usually using a delta of larger than 10 to the power minus 4 seconds. So that is pretty small. You can see it's much smaller than that. We'll talk about why that can and sometimes cannot be a problem. Now, T min is usually unchanged in the inelastic range. We all know that the kind of structures we analyze don't stiffen in the inelastic range. They actually soften. And because they soften in the inelastic range, your periods only elongate in the inelastic range. They don't become shorter. Since the periods elongate, T min um, usually goes up in the inelastic range, if at all. And therefore, that does not affect your stability. Right? So as long as you ensure that your analysis is stable in the elastic range, it usually will continue to remain uh, stable uh, in the inelastic range. Things you need to keep uh, in mind when you're using the central difference scheme is that you cannot omit the assignment of mass or moment of inertia to all degrees of freedom. And the reason being, if you forget to assign mass and moment of inertia to even one degree of freedom, you will have at least one mode that has a natural period of zero. Right? And that's a problem because T min is zero. So delta T must be less than zero. You cannot run your analysis, right? You cannot use the delta T of zero. So you need to make sure that you assign mass and moment of inertia to every degree of freedom in your model. And that's something we often get lazy about. We tend to not do as structural engineers. Uh, we often will assign mass just to sort of, you know, one point in a story and just, you know, ignore assigning mass to other points, assuming that, oh, my, I know that each story is going to go back and forth so I can lump all the mass at one degree of freedom. You can't do that anymore. The analysis won't run. It also becomes impractical to use very rigid elements, which we, again, tend to do sometimes in structural analysis, or penalty constraints. 
Uh, penalty constraints are a way of enforcing constraints using extremely rigid elements as well. The problem is the same, because if you have rigid elements, I mean, think about your SDUF systems, right? If your mass becomes zero, your natural period becomes zero. If your stiffness becomes infinity, again, your natural period becomes zero. So if you have rigid elements somewhere in your model, again, you will end up with a situation where your T min is either equal to or very close to zero. So in that case, again, your delta T, the maximum delta T you can use for your analysis becomes really small. It makes it very impractical to run using that small delta T. So these two things you need to keep in mind when you're developing your model, which again is not that hard to do, right? So instead of using a rigid element, use something that is maybe just a few uh, order, maybe a few uh, times stiffer than the stiffest element in your model. Instead of assigning zero mass, assign at least a small mass uh, so that you can uh, move along. The benefits of doing these two things when you develop a model is you can actually run your model using the central difference scheme. And you can sort of, you know, avoid this issue of numerical non-convergence. And finally, you, if you use a central difference scheme, you're convinced that you will not ever encounter non-convergence. So the time taken to run one analysis is proportional to the duration, to the length of the ground motion. So if I have a 10 second long ground motion, let's say if it takes a time X minutes to run, then a ground motion of length to uh, 20 seconds. Did I say 10 seconds? All right, ground motion with 10 seconds takes X minutes to run. Ground motion with, uh, that's 20 seconds long, will take uh, two X uh, minutes to run, all right? So you know beforehand how long each analysis will take. And that, uh, again, provides some benefits in terms of uh, task scheduling if you're running a large number of ground motions. All right, so I just thought I'll give you a few examples. So this was one of the structural models that I was analyzing in the past. So this is a nine story uh, steel moment frame building. This was a building that was designed as part of the SAC Steel project. It is a very uh, symmetric nine story building. Uh, I've used a concentrated plastic hinge model over here where I have a few elastic elements and then I have these concentrated plastic hinges. So that's a column hinge over there. That's a beam RBS hinge over there. There's a joint panel that sort of models uh, the shear deformation of the beam column uh, joint panels. There's a leaning column that captures the uh, destabilizing effect of the gravity system. So again, this was a very basic uh, model that I was running. The plastic hinges over here follow the IMK bilinear hysteretic model. So this model, although it's called bilinear, is actually trilinear. Uh, the, each, the moment rotation behavior of each of those hinges is captured by a trilinear backbone curve that captures a strain softening behavior post capping. It also incorporates a deterioration algorithm where the strength and stiffness deteriorate after each cycle. Uh, and you kind of, if you're conducting IDA and you're trying to simulate, a, numerically simulate structural collapse, you kind of have to use a model that captures these phenomena or else your IDA curves will never quite uh, flatten out. They will always keep increasing, which isn't very realistic. So I'll talk about the IDA results shortly. Uh, but the fundamental period of this building was about three seconds. What I did was I was conducting IDA. I'll talk about what IDA means for those of you who don't, uh, aren't familiar with this terminology. I, I was looking, it's a type of analysis called incremental dynamic analysis. And I was running my IDA using Newmark average acceleration and the central difference schemes, all right? So I just want to compare the results I get using the two schemes. Okay. Now, the ground motions I used for my analysis were 44 different ground motions from uh, the female P695R field set. Now, the way IDA works is, well, you take each ground motion, you scale it to a certain uh, intensity. The inten ground motion intensity is quantified over here by spectral acceleration, SA3 seconds, which is SAT1 for this building. You take it and you scale it to say, for example, 0.1G. You scale it such that SAT1 is equal to 0.1G and you run the analysis. You simulate the response of the building under that ground motion, scale to that value. And you take the peak story drift ratio from that simulation and you plot one point over there. You then scale the ground motion higher to say SAT1 equals 0.2G. Run the entire simulation, take the peak story drift ratio and put a dot over there, okay? So you keep scaling the gr ground motion to higher and higher intensity levels and that allows you to trace one of these lines, okay? And you will see that at one intensity level, let's say for this ground motion, at some intensity level, at one, your analysis at some point may result in extremely large deformation. You may simulate some ridiculously large deformations, which at which you're sure that your model results cannot be relied upon. 
And that's what we call the onset of dynamic instability. And we say your structure has collapsed at that point. So you simulated the onset of structural collapse. So at that point, you just draw a straight line in your IDA curve. That means at that intensity level over here, your deformations are really large. So I've sort of just truncated it over here at 10%. Now you repeat this for ground motion after ground motion, you get a large number of these lines, okay? What I am primarily interested in is the intensity I need to scale the ground motion to, to cause structural collapse, all right? So I'm interested in all the Y ordinates of all of these points at which these curves terminate, all right? So if I, plot a probability distribution through the intensities at collapse, I get what I call my collapse fragility curve. So for any given ground motion intensity, it tells me what is the likelihood that my structure will have collapsed. All right, so that's essentially what IDA is all about. Now, uh, like I mentioned over here, I conducted this IDA separately using the Newmark average acceleration and the central difference schemes. Now, what I noticed was, in some cases, using the Newmark average acceleration scheme, I got a different IDA curve compared to when I use a central reference scheme. So it essentially means that each, each of these dots over here corresponds to one analysis. So the analysis of the building or the response of the building simulated using that one ground motion scaled to that one intensity. For these cases at low intensities, both the schemes produce the same results. You can see that the red dot is overlay overlays the black dot, right? So the central difference the Newmark scheme produces the same peak story ratio. At, at one point, however, the Newmark scheme, the average acceleration scheme, results in non-convergence. And at the point you reach, you encounter non-convergence that you are not able to resolve. Like you try decreasing delta T, you tried a few things, nothing worked. You're sort of forced to assume that, all right, my structure has collapsed at that point, And you draw a straight line on the idea curve, assuming the structure has collapsed. If, however, you were to use a central different scheme, that would have given you a finite peak deformation at that intensity and at higher intensity levels. Until you simulate the real collapse behavior at a much higher intensity. So the actual collapse capacity is this one, but the Newmark scheme predicts this one uh, over here. Now, of the 44 ground motions I used, the difference in the estimated collapse capacity was larger than 10%. So here you can see it's 23% lower, here 41% lower, 32 and 34% lower. It was larger than 10% for 12 out of the 44 ground motions, okay? So for 12 out of the 44 ground motions, using the Newmark average acceleration scheme, I got a really inaccurate result. And the reason being as follows, because when you use the Newmark scheme, well, you have to obtain your solution by iteration at every time step. And at some time steps, if you're using the full newton raphson algorithm, funny things can happen. Now, ideally you would want your analysis to do something like this. So again, this is just a scalar nonlinear equation. What you're actually solving when you solve an M, when you're analyzing an MDOF model is a, nonlinear system of equations, right? So it's not a scalar equation, it's a matrix equation, but just, I'm just sort of using the scalar equation analogy to demonstrate uh, this phenomenon. So if you were to solve a simple nonlinear problem, you would start with a guess of the root. You would then, well, draw a tangent at that point, you'd come over here, you would then take the, uh, evaluate the function at your new guess x1, draw a tangent, and you finally converge to this root x2. That's what you want to uh, see. And that's what you get most of the times. However, sometime you'll see some funny things like this happening. For example, you might start with a guess that is X zero. You draw a tangent at this point, and then you draw a tangent there and you sort of converge to that route instead. You wanted to converge to this route, but you converge to a different route. Now this is not wrong. It is a valid solution to that nonlinear system of equation is just not the solution that you wanted, all right? So this can lead to errors. You can also often get stuck in loops. This is what happens most of the time in open seas. You start with X zero, draw a tangent there, go to X one, draw a tangent there, and you're back at X zero. So you're looping between X zero and X one as your trial solutions. You never ever converge to the solution over here. All right, this is probably the most commonly encountered non-convergence issue. Then you may also encounter situations like this, where you start with X zero, 
go to x1, draw a tangent there, and that sort of you know shoots off into infinity. So you don't get a valid uh, converged result, right? So these are all types of issues that you can encounter solving uh, nonlinear sum of equations that could lead to non-convergence. Now, remember I mentioned over here, 12 out of 44 ground motions produce non-convergence and therefore the collapse capacity estimated using the Newmark scheme was inaccurate. 29 out of the 44 ground motions did not result in non-convergence. Okay, so you, you can see the IDA curves simulated both using the central difference and the Newmark schemes are more or less the same. Now, there are some few analyses, as you can see over here, for example, where the peak story diff ratio predicted using the central difference and Newmark schemes are slightly different. Which of them is accurate? Uh, nobody knows because you know each of these schemes make certain assumptions about uh, uh, discretized uh, uh, time continuous differential equation in different ways. So they both uh, make assumptions. So it's hard to tell which one's more accurate than the other. They're both valid for all practical purposes. All right, but again, the difference is less than 1% in this final collapse capacity. So I'm not really bothered about uh, less than 1% difference. There are much bigger errors in the structural model and the parameters that uh, you know are more likely to produce errors larger than that. So in the grand scheme of things, this is not really an issue. So the results produced using both the schemes can be considered um, equivalent. Okay. Now, again, each, remember I mentioned each of these dots correspond to one analysis using the ground motion scale to a certain intensity. Here, for example, are the time history traces of the drift ratio at story two under one of the ground motions scaled to a certain intensity level. Uh, I just want to show you what each of these time history traces uh, potentially look like, right? So I've plotted them simulated using both the central difference and the Newmark schemes. You can see that the central difference scheme, well, it produces a valid trace until the 40 seconds, which is the duration of the ground motion. The Newmark average acceleration scheme, again, as you can see, is practically identical until the point of non-convergence, if any. So it just so happened that for this ground motion, at this point, convergence failed, and therefore the Newmark scheme was unable to simulate the remaining uh, response. So this is the point where we assumed that uh, collapse occurred. Although it doesn't seem likely, right? Because the drift is only about 2% uh, over here. You expect, uh, at least for the model that I was analyzing, I would expect it to be stable at least until about uh, 3 to 4% drift. Now, uh, again, you have a few options over here. You can ideally use the Newmark scheme until the point of non-convergence because it allows you to use a relatively large time step. And if you encounter non-convergence, you can then use central difference after that for the bit of ground motion you have left. That should be possible. That seems to be intuitively the most efficient way to go about things. But for some reason, that doesn't really work in open seas. <laughs> if you analyze half the ground motion using average acceleration, the other half using central difference, open seas goes crazy. You get some really funny results. If any of y'all are able to get that working, well, let me know. I'd be interested. Sometimes you see... Uh, differences between the two schemes at large deformations. And that is what results in these small differences over here. But again, these are pretty small differences in the grand scheme of things, they don't really matter. Okay, now here are the collapse fragility curves. That is these curves over here. You see this probability distribution effort over there that I call my collapse fragility curve. So here are the collapse fragility curves I fit using both the central difference and the Newmark schemes, all right? As you can see, the Newmark scheme predicts a median collapse capacity that is corresponding to a probability collapse of 0.5. What is the ground motion intensity? It produces a median collapse capacity of 0.34 G. Central difference produces 0.38 G. So Newmark average acceleration, you can see, is underestimating my collapse capacity, in this case, by about 10%. Reason being, well, some of the ground motions are incorrectly predicting a smaller collapse capacity than ideal. All right, now, although I have spoken only about incremental dynamic analysis, uh, if you were to conduct other types of analysis, like multiple stripe analysis, you could expect similar effects on the collapse fragility curve. Your results will be uh, underestimated, uh, slightly more inaccurate. All right, so that was all about robustness. And we uh, hopefully this gives you, uh, this, this convinces you that the central difference scheme is a bit more robust in terms of uh, nonlinear analysis. It, removes this effect of numerical non-convergence. It gives you a bit more uh, reliability and accuracy in terms of your results. Let's talk about efficiency briefly now, because this is uh, typically the uh, flip side of the coin, right? Because using the central difference scheme, like I mentioned over here, you're limited to using 
a small delta t. So you would assume, it's natural to assume that, all right, you're using a smaller delta t, so your analysis should take longer to run. So that is the price you're paying for more robust uh, simulations, right? That That's often the notion by which people approach these uh, different time integration schemes. Uh, and I want to show over here that it is true to a certain extent, but there are other factors that come into the mix that make it not as big a problem. Okay. So what I have over here is the analysis runtime for different sets of analysis parameters. Okay. So let's start with the first row. So this is the time taken to analyze the model using one ground motion. So this is one analysis using one ground. So, so to essentially conduct one time history analysis. If I were to use the Newmark average acceleration scheme and the ground motion was scaled to a low intensity, uh, intensity level, that is the ground motion is not very intense. The deformations consequently aren't very large. So the model is essentially responding in the linear range. And since the model is essentially responding linearly, there aren't any convergence issues, right? Because uh, linear analyses, you don't have numerical non-convergence. So there are no convergence attempts that need to be done at the point where you encounter numerical non-convergence. In such a situation, using a sparse solver and using a delta T of five and 10 to the power minus three seconds, which again is in the, in the range of the delta T you would typically use, your analysis takes one minute to complete. All right? Just ignore the Frehley damping matrix for now. And one minute is pretty good for a model that complex. It's not that bad at all. The problem comes when you start scaling the ground motion to higher intensity level. So with a high scale factor applied on the ground motion, you now have larger deformations in your model. You now are pushing your model in the nonlinear range and you now are likely to encounter non-convergence. So when you do encounter non-convergence, you start to go through those convergence attempts, use different solution algorithms, decrease your delta T and so forth. That really eats into your efficiency. So what took one minute to run now took 20.9 minutes to run, right? Your delta T was 5 to the power minus three to begin with, and then it became lower as uh, you encountered non-convergence. So your runtime essentially increased 21 fold, which is a problem. Now let's look at what happens if you use a central difference scheme. If you were to use a central difference scheme, I am limited to using a delta T that is as small as 1.5 in 10 to the power minus four. So that is at least, wow, 20 to 30 times smaller than the delta T I was using for my new mark average acceleration scheme, right? Using the small delta T, my analysis took about 16 minutes to run. So 16 minutes is definitely much larger than one minute. So yes, a central difference scheme uh, does take a lot more time to conduct your analysis compared to new max average acceleration. However, it's lesser time than what you would have taken at a high ground motion intensity level where you encounter non-convergence using the new mark scheme. Okay. Now let's see what might happen if instead of using, so again, you guys are aware of Rayleigh damping. Rayleigh damping, your damping matrix essentially computed as a linear combination of your mass and stiffness matrices. Like I mentioned, the mass matrix, there's just one mass matrix that doesn't have a change during your analysis. Your stiffness matrix, however, can change during your analysis, right? You can, so you have a few options over here. You can either use K at your current time step, you can use K at your initial time step, and you have a few options over there. OpenSeas gives you like three options like that. If you're using K at your current time step, well, as you can imagine, that. Break sort of changes with every time step. And if you remember back here, if your C matrix changes with every time step, well, this A matrix needs to be refactorized at every time step, and that makes your analysis slightly less efficient. So using K current, your analysis runtime is 16 minutes. If you just switch that to K initial, or if you were to make your dapping matrix constant for uh, somehow, you can then factor your A matrix just once for your entire analysis, and that brings your analysis runtime down from 16 minutes to just 3.3 minutes using the same time step. Okay, so the solution of system of equations at every time step becomes much, 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 much more efficient. If you were to use only mass proportional damping, your your matrix, the A matrix is now purely diagonal because your mass matrix is always diagonal. You don't have any off-diagonal entries. And solving a diagonal constant matrix is 
extremely trivial. It takes almost no time. So you can see that your efficiency improves slightly more. So your runtime drops from 3.3 minutes to 2.9 minutes. Okay. Now again, and I'm not advocating the use of these damping matrices. There are issues uh, related to uh, spurious damping forces you can expect if you use K initial, so don't do that. Uh, it's been shown that using K current is more accurate than K initial. Mass proportion damping by itself also is not great. However, if instead of using these two damping formulations, if you were to use any other constant damping matrix formulation, like modal damping, you will still reap the benefits of use having a constant damping matrix, all right? OpenSeas provides a modal damping formulation and a couple of other constant damping formulations. So you can try using those instead. And it sort of seems intuitive as well that, well, your damping shouldn't change uh, with your analysis at the same way your mass doesn't change. Do, do we really know enough about damping to sort of, you know, uh, support a non-constant damping formulation? Maybe, maybe not, right? So if you use a constant damping matrix, there's a number of efficiency benefits you can reap using central difference. Okay, so that's analysis runtime using one ground motion. Let's now look at the entire IDA. So I ran the incremental dynamic analysis using 160 processors and dynamic load balancing, right? The dynamic load balancing algorithm I'll talk about shortly. But the total time required to run the entire IDA using the Newmark average acceleration scheme was 118 minutes. Using the central difference scheme, it went up to 154 minutes. Now, even if I used a non-constant damping matrix, yes, that is maybe about a 20% increase in the runtime, but then for the improved robustness and accuracy I'm getting, I, I would say that's a small price to pay. Okay. Now, if you were somehow using a constant damping formulation, well, your analysis runtime drops to about half an hour, and that is about one fourth the amount of time it takes to run your analysis using your mock average acceleration, all right? So again, in the grand scheme of things, the central difference scheme is not just more robust, turns out it's also more efficient. If you're conducting the, uh, an incremental dynamic analysis, where generally the uh, you are looking to simulate collapse and your analyses are more commonly going to be at that collapse intensity, where your deformations are large and your nonlinear uh, response is likely to induce non-convergence. Okay, so that is probably what I would recommend doing in terms of optimal efficiency and robustness. All right, um, how much time do we have? I mean, wow. it's okay. It's 11. I mean, this unless again is not a... very- yeah. <laughs> Unless you no, have I mean, something you can <laughs> carry on. I, I'm good to 12. I mean, uh, this again is something probably not very relevant to most of you, so I'll probably just skim through this. So essentially, this is sort of a paddle algorithm that I developed, the dynamic load balancing algorithm to sort of conduct incremental dynamic analyses more efficiently using on, if you're running these type of simulations on supercomputers. So if you're interested in this, well, you know, feel free to get back in touch with me. I'll send you these slides and we can talk about this a bit further. But essentially, this was just sort of, you know, a description of how you can incorporate dynamic load balancing uh, within your open sea simulations, especially when you're conducting a large number of simulations on a large number of cores using a large number of ground motions. Doing that efficiently is important. And this is sort of just sort of an example I thought I'd give uh, on how to do that. I have a few plots to talk about uh, the paddle efficiency and what affects the paddle efficiency and so forth. Uh, okay, we'll probably just gloss over that. But in conclusion, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is the central difference scheme is not the first choice when we typically approach uh, nonlinear simulations, but it just turns out to be more robust than Newmark average acceleration and also more efficient, uh, apparently, compared to implicit schemes like the Newmark one. It's robust in the sense that it's immune to numerical non-convergence. You do not have to worry about non-convergence. On the flip side, you have to, you know, uh, pay attention to a few things that you may have ignored when you're using the other scheme. So for example, you may have been able to get away with not assigning mass and moment of inertia to all degrees of freedom when using the Newmark scheme, but here you kind of have to do that. You cannot use rigid uh, members of penalty constraints. Now, although these things may look at seem like drawbacks, uh, some research in the past has shown that even if you use the Newmark average acceleration scheme, you still may want to do these things because by just assigning mass and moment of inertia to all your DOFs, uh, not using rigid members, you actually improve your convergence uh, behavior a little better. So you're less likely to encounter numerical non-convergence. So this is something you probably want to do anyway, irrespective of which scheme you're using. 
All right, so that's about robustness. Uh, efficiency, turns out you have shorter runtime despite using a smaller delta T. And that again is more efficient, is made most efficient when you're using a constant uh, damping uh, formulation. And the central difference scheme is also more amenable to parallelization. All right, I mean, as structural engineers, we typically tend to just analyze buildings or as earthquake engineers, typically buildings under earthquakes. But if you were to, you know, uh, put on the, the hat of a mechanical engineer, uh, mechanical engineers also conduct uh, dynamic simulations, not of buildings, but other kinds of uh, structures like uh, cars, uh, sp space shuttles, and so forth. And for example, if you're conducting a blast simulation of a building or a crash simulation of a car, typically they involve large nonlinear deformations, as you can imagine. Such nonlinear analyses are almost always conducted using explicit schemes. So you can sort of uh, see that when you're conducting earthquake simulations involving large nonlinear deformations, you also are likely to benefit from using explicit schemes. Okay. And that is pretty much all I had over here. Uh, happy to take questions. Uh, thanks, Regan, for the presentation. And yeah, any questions from anyone? I mean, usually it takes a couple of minutes again. <laughs> Regan, uh, thanks for the great presentation. It's a shame that we can't, uh, just, I can't just pop down to you in the office, but um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one was the results that you showed where you had the lower collapse for the um, uh, implicit difference. Just did you, were those with the um, current damping uh, stiff, um, stiffness proportional the damping matrix proportional to the current stiffness. You were having these yeah. differences. Yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah, it's quite significant. Um, yeah. And then the second one was more kind of an open sea sort of question around, we have these different um, integrators, which one is the central difference, but there's two other explicit options, which is the explicit difference and also the new mark explicit, um, which are, moly, moly. are also available. Oh, okay. Hmm. Sounds like you're not going to be answering. I, have, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you have uh, references for uh, any of these? I mean, are they described somewhere? Yeah, they're, they're listed in the um, manual uh, or, or like the oh. online. Um, I guess they might, might be new. Perhaps um, I'll have to look them up. But I mean, so, so the yeah. Numax family of schemes, um, they have been widely studied. I mean, if you pull up, say, uh, the Hughes textbook on finite element analysis, there's a good and thorough discussion of why they behave the way they do. Uh, there's a very theoretical uh, reason why uh, the average acceleration scheme does not produce any damp uh, artificial damping. The other members add some damping. So there's, they, they've been historically studied very well. So we understand their properties well. Well, I don't particularly know too much about these other uh, explicit schemes. Now, the central difference scheme is actually also a member of the Newmark family of schemes. Uh, you know, there are these gamma and beta parameters that parameterize the Newmark family of schemes. So if you said gamma and beta equals zero, turns out you get the central difference scheme back. So I think gamma half and beta is zero. Yeah, gamma half and beta equals zero. You get back the central difference scheme. So the central difference scheme is actually a member of the Newmark family of schemes. Um, so I'm not quite sure what explicit Newmark is, yeah, um, I have a feeling it's the up. position where you're um, solving the equations, um, where central was taking it from the center between the two time steps, perhaps. Uh -huh. I'm speculating here. I should probably not. Um, oh, I should probably read through those references. No, I, I haven't looked at that. But no, thanks for pointing that out. I'll take a look. Yeah. Uh, and also this, um, the damping... Um, because this is quite a significant drawback having to use, well, if we can use a constant damping matrix, so you're um, having some success with the, the modal damping formulations or uh, you're- I haven't tried the modal damping myself. Yeah, okay. But it is constant uh, damping formulation. Mm. So yep. you will be able to get a runtime that is very similar to this. I mean, so in the, the only constant damping formulation I used was this one, but I don't see why it should be any different if you use the, at least efficiency wise, if you use the model damping one. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you. I think thank Shinron has also developed a new damping formulation, which I believe is also constant. And I think work is currently underway to implement that in open seas. So, well, yeah, well that's good, good news. Yeah. 
Thanks, Maxim. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Regan. Uh, any other questions from anyone else? Okay, so I'll ask this. Uh, I'll ask yeah. one question. So you said like twelve input, uh, twelve of the ground motions has higher twenty three percent difference, and the twenty nine didn't have right. So the input characteristics of the ground motions, what I mean, is there any similarities in those? Or like, I mean, is any is the input characteristics affecting that, or something like sudden spikes, or what is causing it? Yeah, Did that's a great that? question, actually. I mean, it turns out nothing special. It, it, the occurrence of non-convergence is just this very random phenomenon. I mean, you just get it sometimes, and it happens, like the time history that I showed over here, it can happen not at the peak. People often expect that a non-convergence occurs at the peak uh, drift when your deformations are large. Yeah. It looks like the algorithm was able to get through that peak, and this really spiky region very well and when it was almost stabilizing a yeah. drift of about two percent where you know most of the other drifts are it somehow failed over there and this was the largest the story with the largest drift the, the drifts in the other stories were even smaller than this so it just tends to happen randomly so that's why i said the longer the ground motion okay the larger the likelihood of you encountering numerical non-convergence because well you're just solving that's just my equations and more and more time steps so it's sort of probabilistically the more likely that you are going to experience something like this so, so this 12 i mean i was also like the input periods or something closer to the three second mark or something i mean there was nothing oh, common man. in those 12 no okay i was At just curious my experience Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a great question, actually. But at least in my experience, I mean, we yeah, have ground motions come in all shapes and sizes, but this yes. issue of numerical non-convergence is at, at best random. And uh, another thing is, like, out of the twelve ground motions, like you said, in an idea, you scale it from like multiple, right? Like maybe 10, 20 times, right? Like point one to let's say two point zero. So, how many of those are like? having these differences like or for, for example take there is a ground motion which you showed like which is having 23 percent difference all of them might not have like 23 percent right some of them might be converging some of That's them correct. might not be right so right yeah so these are so for 29 out of the 44 ground motions they almost trace exactly one over the other right there are small differences over here which don't really influence the final at answer. all scales right okay yeah right right okay. at all scales so turns out just 12 out of the 44 ground motions the difference is larger than 10 percent and for the remaining so let's see we have 12 plus 29 39 41 so three ground motions the difference is between one percent and ten percent okay so this difference was sort of between one and so, so, so only the black dots and the red line, all the ground motions above that is not matching or like, so, so my correct. question was like, you have like multiple black dots there, right? So that's like multiple ground motions there. So once your ground motion is hitting this, so you're not running the next ground motions, right? I guess. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, so in so case you run... IDA works. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Go for it. Uh, in case you run the next one, maybe like the other ones are running. I, I'm just yeah, curious maybe. to know. Oh, okay. That's right. Maybe they do. Okay. Maybe they do. I uh, haven't tried okay. that yet. But typically when you conduct okay. IDA, it, it is conventional practice to use the lowest ground motion intensity at which collapse occurs as your collapse okay. intensity. So yeah, you're right. You may have run uh, the same ground motion at an intensity of 0.5 G you may have obtained a valid result. But then that can also occur if the ground motion sort of legitimately causes collapse at say, for example, at 0.6G over here, if you were to run the same ground motion at maybe 0.75G, chances are you may see that it has, uh, it converges to uh, to produce a peak shortage ratio less than 10%. That's what we call a res resurrection. <laughs> That's something that was described uh, again, back in 2002, I guess, when the first papers in IDA were published, that actually happens in uh, structures because what tends to happen is sometimes, yes, you, you see that collapse occurs maybe at the peak, uh, at the roof, maybe the roof uh, drift is 
or the drift of the higher story is larger than 10% on cause collapse. If you scale the ground motion even higher, sometimes the ground story might uh, develop large nonlinear deformations. So it might sort of act like a base isolator to a certain way uh, because it sort of is sort of absorbing most of the energy at the ground level. It's sort of, you know, saving the upper stories. So the collapse mechanism might change as you scale the ground motion higher. And as, a, as you transition from one collapse mechanism to the other, you might see that volume drifts become small again. So your IDA curves can sort of go like that. It can sort of loop back up and then it can increase again. So that happens sometimes. So in that, in those cases, it's always conventional practice to use the smallest ground motion intensity at which collapse occurs as your collapse intensity, which is why we tend to sort of draw the flat line right from there. Okay, well, thanks. Oh, it's a great question. Thanks for that. Uh, any other questions from anyone? Come on, guys, don't be shy. Um, I know you have questions. questions. I have a question yeah, for Regan. Hello, hi Regan. Thanks for the presentation. That was really, that was really interesting. Thanks so much. My 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 question is, um, if for example we're not doing IDA or we're not doing something that is very what's the word that is very that needs so much power, would it still be advantageous to use this central central what central mark difference scheme? Central difference. Central, central difference, difference right. scheme. Yeah. Right. No, of course. Yeah, for sure. Because again, uh, I spoke about two things today. Well, one of them was efficiency. That is the time taken to complete the analysis. And you're right. Mm -hmm. If your analysis doesn't take very long, efficiency is not really an issue. I mean, if it takes one minute versus two minutes to run, not that big a deal, right? Uh, but robustness uh, is still an advantage in the sense that, yes, you will still benefit from using the central difference scheme or maybe some of the other explicit schemes that Maxim mentioned as well if you're able to eliminate that issue of numerical non-convergence. So again, the Newmark scheme is a good place to start out with. Why not, right? Try it out. If it's working out and your convergence behavior is good, by all means use it. It's definitely more efficient. However, if you see that you're having trouble with numerical non-convergence, then that's probably a sign that you may benefit from using an explicit scheme because it sort of, you know, removes this problem of numerical non-convergence. Mm. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. So even if, um, what they call this, um, what's the word? Because I noticed that if you use the central difference, like in your slide right here, if you use the central difference, you get, you know, higher, higher capacities in your structure. So for example, even if I get good convergence from the new mark, uh, from the new mark scheme, if, if I, if I get convergence from the new mark scheme, maybe I don't have to try the central difference scheme. Yeah, of course. Mm, so if cool. you were yeah. not encountering numerical non-convergence, and, and if you were conducting uh, IDA, yeah. uh, the there you IDA go. curves you guess, using both the schemes would have been the same. Right. right. Yep. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. So it doesn't matter which you're using. Over here. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm. No worries. Yeah. Thanks for that. Any other questions? Other questions, folks? Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you, Professor. Just a simple question. So why is the new mark algorithm is so popular and why, you know, many people, it's the go-to, right? The first thing everyone remembers yeah, yeah. to use is the new mark algorithm. Yeah. Why is that? That's a fantastic question. Thanks. Uh, so I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. What's your name? Salam. Oh, Salam. Salam. Hi, thanks for your question. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, and I think the reason it is so popular is because when we study dynamics, or at least when I study dynamics, we always talk about linear dynamics. When we talk about uh, the uh, simulating the response of an SDF system, we always talk about linear SDF systems. We don't ever talk about nonlinear systems. When you're talking about linear systems, yes, it makes no sense to use a central difference scheme. You want to use a new mark scheme because well, the new mark scheme allows you to use larger time steps. It is unconditionally stable. And when you're analyzing a linear system, there is no issue of non-convergence, right? The, the system of equations you're solving is purely linear and there is no iteration that is needed. Everything is purely deterministic. So it makes no sense to use any other scheme. A new mark scheme obviously has all of these fantastic advantages for linear analysis. The problem is we assume that 
the same benefits translate over to nonlinear analysis as well. And I think that's where that bit of disconnect occurs because when you move to nonlinear analysis, yes, it is still unconditionally stable, but then you now have to deal with this non-convergence issue and people just sort of, I guess, assume that, well, that is part and parcel of doing nonlinear analysis, but you will have to uh, use an iterative scheme. And the drawbacks of the central difference scheme, when you use linear analysis, you will see that suddenly aren't all that bad when you move to nonlinear, because yes, as long as you ensure that your scheme is stable, you won't have to worry about numerical non-convergence. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right, no worries, thanks for that. Hey again, uh, I have a question regarding your grand motions, kind of come back to the Pavan question. I remember that you used the uh, grand motions from four field records. If we use a bit more complex type of grand motions like near fold grand motions, I'm guessing this difference would be much higher. What is your- Potentially. Yeah. Potentially. Have you tried that or? I have run a few, uh, 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 near field records with uh, strong pulses. But that again is all of these, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, these ideas that we have about what causes non-convergence, some of them are valid. Some of them I have seen, at least in my practice, aren't very valid. For example, if you go back to this, let's assume that this is the response under a pulse-like drawn motion, right? It, it kind of looks like the response under a pulse-like drawn motion, where this is probably the response during the a large velocity pulse and then the rest of the ground motion, well, you know, it's not very intense. We would assume that it is during this pulse that non-convergence happens, right? That's a large pulse, large nonlinear deformation, and that's where you would expect non-convergence. At least from what I've seen, that is usually not the place where I encounter non-convergence. In some cases, yes, but in a large number of cases, no, non-convergence can occur somewhere over there. It is this pretty random, thing that occurs at any point it likes, usually towards the end of the ground motion because your plastic hinges have, you know, degraded, deteriorated, your strength and stiffness have dropped quite a bit. And because stiffness is sort of, you know, uh, softening, negative in some cases, your stiffness matrix can become poorly conditioned and that can often lead to these non-convergence issues. But usually when the pulse occurs at the start of the ground motion, well, unless your deformation has become really large, uh, in which case it's genuinely affecting the stiffness right over here, except for those kinds of situations. I haven't seen any steady patterns in terms of uh, where non-convergence occurs. So I don't think the results may change that much depending on the type of ground motions I use. However, I think it will change depending on the type of model I use. And that is probably the more important thing. I mean, here I've used a certain type of uh, hysteretic model to model the plastic hinges. The complexity of the model plays a big role in determining how well it converges, how it doesn't. If you were to use a simpler uh, hysteretic model, chances are you may not have to see so much convergence. But then, I mean, if you see where we are headed as a profession, we are moving on to more and more complex models uh, being used more and more frequently. So yeah, this is something we will have to resolve uh, looking ahead, I guess. So, answer your question, Vaid. Okay, thanks. To, to no add that discussion, I had one more question continuing that. So you, in your conclusions, you said like, uh, uh, can you go to your conclusion slide please once? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you said like explicit schemes are preferred for the blast and crash simulation in, involving large nonlinear deformations, right? So it kind of contradicts like, because we are not expecting the convergence issues at the large deformations, right? It's like at some random point, then why is the explicit schemes uh, preferred there? Because then my other question in parallel to this was like, oh, so you, do you recommend explicit schemes in liquefaction and land, like large scale deformations kind of thing, landslide deformations and all those things. So I thought like both were. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. No, you're right. I mean, I guess the distinction to make is moving from linear to nonlinear. So the instant you step into the nonlinear regime, 
you can expect trouble with uh, implicit schemes. So any kind of simulation where by definition you're expecting nonlinear response, the, again, for fields that aren't structural and earthquake engineering, you would typically by default start with an explicit scheme. It's just that as convention, by, by convention, uh, earthquake engineers tend to by default start with Newmark. And then if that doesn't work, try other things. Most other fields, they will sort of, again, when I say most, I mean, you know, you know the other fields that I've read up about like uh, car crash simulations and blast simulations and so forth. They will often anticipate these issues and start with an ex explicit scheme uh, right to begin with. I guess that's what I was trying to say over there. Um, sorry, what was the other question? Yeah, so my question was like, because we are not expecting non-convergence in the at large deformation points and at some random points. Yeah, yeah. So why would explicit scheme, I mean, I understand any scheme can be, I mean, any situation explicit can, can be advantages not only for these large deformation cases, right? Like even for a simple case, explicit should be beneficial because our convergence issues are not specifically occurring at those cr right. crazy points, right. like normal points, right? So. Yeah, no, I, I remember you asked about liquefaction. I was gonna say that maybe Maxim can answer that question probably uh, <laughs> better than me because uh, I don't have too much yeah. experience with the liquefaction simulations, but then, Frankly, uh, geotechnical models are better suited for okay. using an explicit scheme than our structural models because they tend to be continuum meshes. Yes. And it's, you, it, you cannot, you don't assign mass per node for these continuum meshes. You sort of assign a certain uh, continu a continuous density and then yes. sort of the mass matrix sort of is inferred from that uh, density field. So you don't have to worry about a few of the things that you need that you typically tend to worry about uh, in structural models. You cannot have infinite stiffness in a soil model uh, unless you're doing some funny uh, interface with a, a foundation and you want to assign a few springs over there. You may have that option of enforcing, use, enforcing some constraints using some rigid springs. But then geotechnical continuum models in general are more... Uh, amenable to use in a central difference scheme because you just need to make sure that your mesh is sort of consistent. If you have very, very small elements that typically ensure results in your eigenvalues become, becoming really large and your, more, your lowest mode impedance becoming really small. Uh, so as long as you've designed your mesh well, uh, you should typically be able to use a central difference scheme without much uh, issues. It is only when you have really, really small elements in conjunction with really large elements. Frankly, when you have that, you can use what you call hybrid schemes, which allow you to use an implicit scheme for the part of your mesh that has really small elements. Like for example, maybe you're transitioning from a coarse mesh to a fine mesh uh, and the fine mesh is used only in areas where your strain gradients are really large. You can use an implicit scheme only for that region and you can use an explicit scheme for the rest of your uh, model so that you're controlling delta T is not affected by that fine part of the mesh. And it's just controlled by the coarse part of the mesh. So you can actually use hybrid schemes. And that is again, possible, not in open seas. I don't think that is available, but again, other uh, more sophisticated finite element software like Abacus will allow you to use that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Oh, thanks Vato. Looks like no questions. <laughs> I mean, if, I mean, yeah, looks like no more questions. I mean, guys, if you have any, if, I mean, I, I guess like they can email you, right, Regan? Like, yeah, can, feel free to uh, flick me an email in case you have any cool. questions. Happy to talk cool. about this offline. Cool. So I think uh, then we will end the presentation today. With this note, thank you, Regan, for the presentation. We really appreciate it. Of course. It was fun. Thanks, Robin. Sure no, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. I'm sure it will help a lot okay. of people who are trying to do this. So, cool. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Talk to you later. Cheers.